I'm on a quest to find the perfect 2-in-1 laptop. It needs to be 14 inches or less, classy, and affordable. I recently reviewed the ThinkPad X13 Gen 2 from 2021 and found it to be damn near perfect. Before I declare it to be my mobile daily driver, I need to do my due diligence and review its closest competitor. Slap Tech. This, then, is the Dell Latitude 7320 2-in-1, also from 2021. I found it in like-new condition on the used market for $600. It's also available as a regular laptop and as a detachable tablet-type thing. This particular model has the Intel Core i7-1185G7, a 4-core 8-threaded power sipper of a CPU with 12 megs of cache that runs up to 4.8 gigahertz. On board is the integrated Iris XE GPU with the highest number of 96 execution units. 32 gigs of soldered RAM is what's installed here, and a 256 gig NVMe SSD stores things. These bits sit underneath a 13.3 inch 1080p LCD display that does 60 hertz and 100% sRGB at 300 nits. It weighs 2.8 pounds, and this particular unit has the larger 63 watt hour battery. The AC adapter for this laptop is a compact 65 watt USB-C brick with 9 feet of cord length. With an aftermarket from the wall cord, the range can be extended to 12 feet. This will easily fit in any laptop bag and is no burden at all to carry around. The battery life of this little flexible number is pretty great. 8 hours and 45 minutes of internet work use and 6 hours and 15 minutes of streaming video is nothing to sneeze at. When it comes time for some fun stuff, 2D retro games keep it alive for 7 hours and 15 minutes, and Dolphin and PC games will last for 2 hours. Modern Thin and Lights with Core Ultra CPUs stay alive for a couple more hours of internet work use, but the numbers for this laptop are already quite fantastic. Keep in mind this is off a full capacity battery. If buying a used example, your mileage may vary. This laptop is completely wrapped in a brick of brushed aluminum. There's practically no flex in the chassis and the display is super rigid, taking quite a bit of torque to slightly bend. There's no such thing as fingerprints or any oils on the body and I can't even tell that I've used the touchpad even though I clean it off anyway because I'm that kind of crazy your mother warned you about. The keyboard keys are relatively less resilient and will display finger oil after a good amount of use. Let's see what all those holes in the side do. On the right is a mini SD card reader, SIM card slot under that, Thunderbolt 4 that does DisplayPort 1.4, USB-A 3.2 Gen 1, HDMI 2.0, and a lock slot. The left is where we get the second Thunderbolt 4 with DisplayPort 1.4, the main vent, and headset in. Only one USB-A port is a shame, but predictable, and at least this laptop has a card reader. That makes it a breeze to utilize the great display for on-the-go amateur photo editing. The insides of this laptop hold no surprises with soldered RAM, but thankfully do allow the full-sized M.2 2280 SSD to be upgraded. Two thin heat pipes carry temps away to the single fan, and there is a WAN slot for a 5G modem. The speakers are on polar opposite sides of the laptop for maximum stereo separation, and one of them looks to be thicker with a subwoofer on it. Ooh. Back on top is a smooth criminal of a keyboard. The keycaps are standard Dell Latitude with soft edges, soft feedback, and soft frequency response. The letters melt under my fingertips and are librarian approved with virtually silent action thanks to my light typing touch. Home and end live as function keys in a predictable placement next to dedicated insert and delete. I have no qualms with this and especially favor page up and down as secondary functions of arrow keys. The 95% size doesn't make me feel claustrophobic, but it does look like the edges could easily be extended to fit the same full-sized keyboard from the 7400 series. In other news, the classy keyboard backlight highlights the crisp key labels with two stops and looks too damn good. I love this keyboard for its simplicity, utility, and all-encompassing elegance. There's a reason why it hasn't changed much after many generations of latitude, and I can't say I blame them. And then there's the touchpad. It's not bad and doesn't get in the way while typing at all. Acceleration and gestures are predictable and work reliably well. 
Finding right click is a challenge and I don't always get it, but I tend to press the extreme edge, which apparently doesn't tickle the exact right spot. Can we have physical keys again, please? Maybe Framework can give us a modular touchpad with physical keys. On second thought, I'd settle for Framework marketing material with a clean laptop. Would it hurt to wipe down the notebook before snapping the pic? Asking for a friend. Moving on and moving up, there's a screen. Also, F9 doesn't have a hotkey. Make it a touchpad toggle. It's not doing anything else, and it's not doing anything on modern latitudes either. But yeah, the screen. Tilts all the way back like a tablet and has Wacom pen support. While it does reproduce 100% of the sRGB color space, the deepest blacks and brightest whites are a little shy and don't pop out. In the spaces between these extremes, gradients are ultra smooth for an 8-bit LCD monitor. Viewing angles are also excellent with colors that don't distort at any angle, with brightness that dips at a close angle, but it's a two-in-one with strong, silent hinges so it will always be possible to find a comfortable viewing angle. Speaking of the hinges, they're so stiff that there's zero screen wobble while using this laptop. The biggest letdown is the ghosting. Motion is plenty blurry in all media. It perturbs the gamer in me. While not a deal breaker, it's not impossible to have faster gray to gray even for a small pen compatible touchscreen. At least the input lag is within normal tolerances, so a fun time can still be had on this monitor. And those fun times will be enhanced by the speakers. Not that they're great speakers, but they're damn good enough. A careful balance between the mids and highs allows for rich clarity. The bass isn't strong by any means, but quite a bit comes out in the mix. The bass in Calm Like a Bomb by Rage with our Cafe Macchiatos is present and accounted for, while the deep bass in the package by A Perfect Crop Circle near my wine vineyard is very weak and only the low twang is audible with no semblance of pitch. The volume is also respectable, but not quite enough to fill a room. This is a test of the webcam here on the Dell Latitude 7320. 720p, this is an excellent lighting. If you spring for the 14-inch model of the same generation, you get bumped up to a 1080p webcam, and the microphone quality seems to be good, but not great. System performance of the ULV Core i7 was already mid in its heyday, so naturally it's even more obtuse in today's market. I'll add that it wasn't fully obsoleted until the Core Ultra series a few years later, and that's because the 12th and 13th generation U CPUs ran hot and heavy. Fast forward to today, and what can you do with it? Quite a bit, actually. Especially office work like PowerPoint and Excel. Light tasks like short form 1080p video editing or Photoshop with a few filters will be a breeze, but 4K video editing and multi-layered Lightroom projects should be reserved for more modern latitudes. Even though it's down on power, expect normal PC tasks to result in very little, if any, fan noise and cool temps throughout when unplugged and using the balanced power mode. Under duress, expect very low fan noise that goes along with its very low power usage of only only 15 watts, or a regular performance CPU will accept 45 watts in most cases. But thanks to the efficiency of the CPU, does using one third of the power really mean one third of the performance? Yes. Yes, it does. To be fair, the 11th gen ULV CPUs represent a unique point in computer history where adequate performance meets high efficiency and cool temps, a careful balance that wasn't executed as well in the 12th and 13th generation processors. On to gaming. The more powerful Iris Xe GPU is present and accounted for with all of its glorious 96 execution units. It's great at playing really old games and terrible at playing just plain old games if that makes any sense. If Snake Pass will run at 60 frames per second in medium details at 1080p, then that PC can play anything. This little number requires low details with downsampling, taking the resolution down to 540p in order to reach 60. Ugh. With modern games out of the question, let's talk about what it can do. 
2D indie games will run great, like Hollow Knight, the most complex 2D game I know. Some 3D indie titles will also perform well, like Minecraft, Hotshot Racing, and Overcooked 2. Even Diablo 3 is a great experience at 900p resolution. If your PC game library is curated to simple or old games, you'll be fine. And it'll play PC games for up to two hours and only get very warm and not uncomfortable at all while it's at it. Retro games are a similar story. Dolphin and PCSX2 are surefire bets even at 2x native res. While modern core ultra CPUs can last for up to 5 hours in Dolphin, this old CPU has to give all it's got to the cause, so only 2 hours of battery life is all there is. 2D retro games are much better suited to this laptop, lasting up to 7 hours and 15 minutes in battery saver. I just wish the ghosting was less pronounced. It gets old fast and tends to wear out my eyeballs faster than other screens with less blurry motion. For the bottom line, the Latitude 7320 is a fantastic mobile companion that also serves as a 2-in-1. The cool, quiet nature with competent processing power and compact dimensions guarantee a PC that will fit in any space and perform any task, albeit sometimes requiring a little bit more patience than contemporary offerings. Is it the best classic 2-in-1 to be found? Well, I recently reviewed the ThinkPad X13 Yoga Gen 2 with the same CPU, and there is a comparison video coming down the pike. I will be getting to the bottom of it. In conclusion, students get four and a half thumbs up. I don't know where the half came from, it just showed up one day and I'm throwing it into the prize pool. This tablet wannabe is light, has great battery life, and great peripherals for all day-to-day -day tasks. And when there's time to waste playing today's games, you can't do it because it's not possible. You'll just have to study extra hard. Or play indie or retro games. You know, the good games. Casual gamers can pick this up if they fully understand the caveats and are sure their favorite games will play on here. There's also plenty of ghosting, so if the 2-in-1 nature of this device isn't a necessity, the 7420 is only a little bit less small and exhibits less motion blur. My two cents. Competitive gamers can stay clear away, obviously. Too few teraflops with too much blur. If it's all you got though, at least it's solid built and can handle the abuse after taking the 10th headshot in Fortnite. Remember, it's not that they're hacking, it's that your FPS is tanking harder than the terafladen stock market. Desktop replacement users won't find enough performance here. It's fine enough to discover a hobby with, but as soon as you start to dive in and realize how much power it takes, like photo or video editing, an upgrade will be a necessity. Home users, I present to you your laptop. It's super easy to carry around the house, is a joy to consume media on, answer emails, and perform office work with, and is resistant to fingerprints. No matter who all in the household has touched it, those sweaty stains will be as invisible as Rachel Zeigler's conservative fan club. This has been a review of the Dell Latitude 7320 2-in-1 here on Slaptech. If you have any questions about this laptop, life in general, or who the hell Rachel Zeigler is, post them in the comment section below. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe if you want to be in the know about other great older laptops. Stay tuned for a head-to-head -head comparison between this Latitude 7320 2-in-1 and the ThinkPad X13 Gen 2 Yoga right here on Slaptech. Thanks for watching and you guys, have a good night.